And then uh, now I'm going to put it on Facebook Live. It'll take about 40 seconds. Can I go to my Facebook and tell people to and share it? How I do that? Let me see. Absolutely. Yeah. My people. You know, my I'm going like to make people. it open to the public. So okay. they don't have to be my friend. <laughs> Boo, how long you been retired? 14 years now. Wow. It's been that long? Yeah, my last season was 2007. And how I many think I'm, I'm older than you think I am, bro. <laughs> you don't look like it, but you, you always been like that. <laughs> Thank you. All right. We are going live. I will let you know exactly when, but it's good to see you. Yes, sir. Are you funny? I thought about you last night. You're talking about Austin. <laughs> What'd you say? Oh. <laughs> I thought about you last night talking about Austin. <laughs> Man, we used to have fun when we went to Austin. Uh, Earl Campbell used to uh, come and get us and take us to his place to eat sausages and and uh, right? we would hang out. Cause, uh, I met him in Kansas last year. His, his daughter played soccer for, for, uh, top, for, for Texas and he came to the game. Yeah, how's he doing? Just okay. They said just uh, Chauncey Billups. I, I, I met Matt Chauncey Billups up there because his daughter plays and he said he's he's in good physical shape, but he don't remember a lot. He won't remember you from yesterday. Wow. Yeah. But still look good. Still got his, you know, physical strength and was mobile. But as far as, you know, being vocal and active, it was, it was sad. Wear and tear from his career, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. I hate that for him, man, because he would he would come in the locker room. We're talking about Earl Campbell, he'd come to the locker room, have his little dip of uh, skull in his jaw, <laughs> and have his tight tight Burt Reynolds jeans on, <laughs> had his Lamont Sanford mustache, <laughs> and man, we used to have a good time with him. Then he would bring us sausages from his company and everything. Is but anyway, right? man, we got to get yeah. on to Jarris <laughs> Howard. So let me get started here. Welcome to celebrating Greater Peoria area's rich basketball history. Youngsters these days need to do their homework. Well, here is another lesson. This is Jaren's Howard from Peoria High, <laughs> my alma mater from my hometown. How you doing, Jaren? Pretty good. I'm fresh out of practice uh, down here in the Long Long Star State, and uh, just feel feels good. I, you know, I'm a fan of the show. I've always been a fan of you. Uh, especially you coming from not only Peoria, but from Peoria High. So I just always, you know, you actually um, expire me to, 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 to start writing a book on Peoria history basketball and just reading all your literature and talking to my, my brother, the late Tyrone Howard, who I pitched the idea to him and he passed away maybe a week afterwards. So it's, it's something that's, uh, that's really motivating and something that um, I, I need to have you involved, and uh, I need to have the whole Peoria involved. But just, just really, really blessed and grateful uh, to be on the show and to to to, to share my story and uh, to, to to talk some Peoria basketball. All right. Well, thank you, and uh, thank you for coming on, man. You're a busy, man. You just took this job down in down in Texas, and it's recruiting season, big time going on right now. So we got to get it in before it's too late. So exactly. <laughs> before we get into to Texas and Kansas and Illinois, we got to go back. We got to go back to Peoria, Illinois, right. P-Town. <laughs> Where it tell us, tell everybody who put the ball in your crib. How'd right. you get started in the game of basketball? Tell us what it was like growing up in P-Town. Well, you know, I was blessed because I grew up in the Pearson Hills. Uh, you know, some, some of the best basketball players that ever come out of Peoria, not only, you know, grew up there and was raised there, but where we competed at and played was uh, right across the street, the Salvation Army, and we call it the Sal. Uh, mm -hmm. We, you know, throughout the week we'll play, and then on Saturday mornings, you know, it was like the NBA, you know, NBA playoffs, but it was cool for me because I, I had a routine. I would wake up, eat a, a, a bowl of cereal, watch Pee Wee Herman, get my ball, and then I would walk and meet my mom, uh, uh, over at the uh, at the Salvation Army, and then it was another cool deal that you know people know Peoria basketball. My dad was Snake, uh, the late Larry Howard, you know, aka Snake. He was a referee, and they never would let him ref my game. So there was a time where, you know, it was a special time because that's where it all started. You know, my dad 
put the ball in my hand and, you know, credit my brother Tyrone Howard. But I learned how to count in my ABCs dribbling the basketball. Uh, if every, everybody know growing up in the Pearson Hills, you went, to, we stayed next to uh, a lady I called her granny. And when that was Miss Stone, Ivan Stone mom, who is a legend, who, who was my babysitter. You know, people didn't know, know that Ivan Stone, you know, babysitting me. So I was, I was always around the game of basketball. I was always around players. I'm talking about real guys that, that could really play. And uh, that, that always was um, something that I took pride in. Every time I stood, stepped on the floor, uh, whether I was in college or AU, that I'm from Peoria and uh, I got to represent. And, and, and that, that, that's something that I think all Peoria basketball players uh, uh, stand out and they take, they take things personal and they're really, really competitive. Absolutely. I remember your father when I was a little boy. I'm older than you. I'm, I believe I'm 15 years older than you. But uh, and me and Ivan like Stone, <laughs> me and Ivan Stone grew up together. Uh, I lived in Timber Oaks. Right. And he was in Pearson Hill, so I was over there every day playing with him and a, another brother named Dennis Broadnax. Was that? Was that? Yeah. yeah. So uh, I remember your father down at State Park because my father used to go down there to play. And I used to be afraid of your father because your father was somebody that you didn't mess with. Uh, and they called him Snake. Exactly. And I was just I was just a little boy. So I was like, I'm scared of that dude. But he and my dad was always cool because I, um, my dad told me that he was from the west side of Chicago. Exactly. And my dad was a south sider. So they had that kinship very yeah. early. But I do remember your father growing up. Cool. Of course, I had the opportunity to meet your brother, Tyrone. I was out globe trotting, came back. I heard they had this great team in 1988-89 season. Went over to Central uh -huh. uh, to see Chuck and the team and get a run in. And next thing you know, I was in the hornet's nest with this dude named Chris Reynolds all over me. This young oh. high school boy. The best me on the ball defender in, to come out of Peoria. By Man, far. I almost had to beat him off me. <laughs> That's how bad he was. But I, I remember your family very well, man. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And that you bring you bring up that team. You know, I was the ball boy for that 89 when they went down the state and lost in triple overtime. So from the peak wow. of holiday tournament all the way to the, the state championship game, I was with those guys. And that's why it's personal. Those guys were my big brothers. They, they, I mean, yeah. I was in the locker room. Uh, they, they tossed me around, they beat me up, they, they threw their jerseys on me, and I loved every minute of it. And that was my connection to, to Peoria High, um, watching Chris Reynolds uh, just pick up 94 feet, uh, watching that team from Charles White, who was 6'3", that played like he was 6'9". Mm -hmm. uh, I thought every time Mike Hughes shot the basketball, it was going in. And then one of my all-time favorite players is Mike Kirksey, was a, just a young freshman. Uh, just getting in where he fit in. And, you know, you, you talk, you, Courtney Saison and uh, that staff with, you know, Bob Darling, Chuck Bishop, those guys raised me. They were part of my, my upbringing and reason why uh, I, I, I credit them a lot because, you know, without seeing that, and, you know, I saw how a team, you know, they went undefeated the whole, the whole year right. and they, they stayed, they stayed humble. And uh, when I, when I think about hard times and I think about real teams and what makes a good team, I always reflect back to that to the 89 Peoria High team. Well, I remember them very well. It's unfortunate I didn't get a chance to see them play live that year. Like I said, I was globetrotting, but I did watch, uh, I don't know where I was in the country, but I was able to watch the game on WGN and was in disbelief, the ending of it. Right. But uh, that's a legendary team. I've been trying to get them on, but it's been difficult rounding the guys up because people have been smacking me on the back of my head about that team. So hopefully I'll get them on before it's too late. Right, right. But I want to ask you, you went to, uh, well, you lived in Pearson Hills. Right. That was very close to uh, my neighborhood on Idaho. I played yeah. in the same Salvation Army, and then I was boys with Ivan. We went to Sterling. And right. everybody that went to Pearson Hills or lived in Pearson Hills went to Sterling. Did you go to Sterling as well? So I went to Sterling as, a, as in kindergarten. Then we were blessed enough to finally – get a home and then we moved down down the hill on, on 1304 West Third Street. And boo, you boo, I can't make make this up. So you, uh what you call it? Uh the um uh, the, the the zoning of Manuel Central and, and people to this day you ask Coach McLean because Coach McLean and uh Dana came over because my mom and my, my uncles everybody went to Manuel. 
but I grew up, you know, as a ball boy, my brother played. So my side of third street was manual. And if you cross the street, it was central side. And, 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 I, and I mean, we went to the district again. The only way, people don't know this, and, and, and Monte Williams mom, Nene, she played at manual. She calls me and said, Jarrett, you enroll, they call in algebra, they call it in, in two classes in algebra science, they're calling your name. So Coach McLean and Dana knew I lived in manual district and I don't know how I got on manual schedule, but I was at Central. And the re only reason why I could go to Central because the business academy, you know, they put that rule in if, if they have something that another school could offer. That's how, you know, a lot of Chicago kids move around. So the Central had a business academy. So uh, Bish and my mom uh, knew I really wanted to go to Central and that was the loophole for me uh, going to uh, going to Central. A lot of people don't know that. People just, just assume, but I, I got close with Crushton Coleman in my eighth grade year. Right. Uh, and he was he was the, one of the best players in the city and played at Blaine. And um, we was calling ourselves the next Ivan uh, uh, Ivan and Willie. And I look, you know, I, I grew up loving Ivan Watson and Willie Coleman game. And and that summer we was like this. And I was going to Manny Open Gym, and it, but it was something in me that took me back to those 80, 88, 89 when I used to run out first in the field house and and, and, and those guys would be behind me. So uh, the, the maroon and, and black and white was 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 in me. So, but I have no regrets. I would, I, if I had to do it all over again, I'd do it the same because um, I'm it, it, I'm a diehard Peoria High line. It, it's in me. It, it's been in me since I was eight years old. Well, you did um, you did your work at Central, without a doubt. Uh, what three time uh, all conference player, which doesn't happen very much with all the talent in the greater Peoria area. But you were first team three years in a row. Freshman year, I believe you got to play with uh, uh, somebody that you uh, looked up to in A.J. Guyton. And you guys had some great teams, but could never get past Manuel. I think uh, you may have only beat Manuel one, one time, time yes, my in senior the four year. years. My and I've had year. the Manuel guys on, and they always remind me. <laughs> and, I, and I keep saying, I got it, I got it. Right, right, right. But uh, that must have been tough we, we, we to have those great zones. teams. We, I mean, and don't get me wrong, take nothing away from Coach McClain and, and, and Frank and Serge and Griff. Those are my, some of my, my, my closest friends. The reason why I went, I choose, you know, chose to go to the University of Illinois, but we didn't have nothing for Griff. You know, Griff beat us twice on a tip in at the last second shot. And um, I remember just hearing Coach McClain, he had a play called Summertime. And it was, it was, it was so smart. And all it was was just, and make or miss, they got the ball out quick. And they just gave it to Frank and he just played like they were at Proctor Center or Carver. And so, it, but it goes back to why Coach McClain was so good is that he, he, a lot of people can't coach talent. A lot of people can't coach, coach egos, but he had a presence where he was demanding and he let those guys play. You know I mean, you got Frank Williams who, to me after, you know, Howard, uh, my list changes my top five because you could go Howard, AJ, Shire, Howard, AJ, Frank, but you know, they're all great players, but uh, just that field house atmosphere, you know, the, the day before, I mean, people skip a school to go to Chicago to go get an outfit just to come, miss school just to come to the game. And I remember I got grounded, boom. Uh, I got a, a D in chemistry. No, excuse me, at uh, Roosevelt. And I was a ball boy for, and my mom, I, this is when I knew she was real. I could not go to the Manual Central game. But remember B92 used to have it on the radio. Wow. So I had a rollout rail. I took it in the back and I turned the radio on. And I really at from the starting lineup to the to, to the fourth quarter, to the fourth quarter, I played. And it, it was just something that I was like looking back at it, like, man, people probably thought I was dumb. I was out there talking to myself, calling timeouts when they called timeouts. So uh when I say Peoria basketball means a lot to me. It's, it's in me. Without a doubt. Well, you won the top high school players in the state your senior year. Tell me about the recruiting process. Uh, who was uh, who was after you? I mean, you ended up, everyone knows, at Illinois, but who else was recruiting you? Well, well I got recruited by the, the entire Big Ten. Um, I made a name for myself at the Nike All-American camp. Uh, there was so-called... So three guards had ahead of me, which, you know, it turned out to be true, but it was Jason Williams, Steve Blake, uh, Kevin Gaines. Okay, wait, we say Jason Williams. Jay Williams. 
not the white chocolate. Jay Williams from Duke. What's it? Okay. All yeah, right. Yeah. St still one of my good friends to this day because of that camp. But you know, Boo, in summertime, you're going up against AJ, Howard Nathan, Willie Coleman, uh, Mike Curtis, some of the best. You know, that's what makes Peoria basketball because the older guys always came back to the old, open gym. So I never forget my AU coach for the Illinois Warriors, Larry Butler. He was like, Chairs, you got this this kid from Vegas and this guy from New Jersey, that, you know, you got to bring it today. I'm like, like, man, I, I guard AJ Guyton every day in practice. <laughs> you know what I mean? I guard Frank Williams every day at, at Carver. So uh, I, that's why I kind of earned a lot of people respect because when when, it, when the ball was up in the air, uh, I didn't look at them as the number one point guard in the country. I looked at them like this is just another guy <laughs> that got game right. from Peoria. So I, was, I picked up 94 feet. Uh, you know, you know, as Peoria guys, we got a little handle, we got a little wiggle to us. So, I, you know, I, I had to let him know it was, you know, right away. And that's what I tell my son now, who's 11. I said, the first possession of every game was somebody try to pressure you, just hit him with everything. And then I bet you they bag up for the rest of the game. So, <laughs> but yeah, but, but those, but uh, uh, the big 10, but it came down to three schools, Illinois, Indiana, and DePaul. Um, okay. And uh, people don't know this, before I made my decision, I went down to Peoria Emanuel and met with Coach McClain before I made my decision. Uh, my AAU coach, Larry Butler, wanted me to go to DePaul and play with Quentin Richardson and uh, Bobby Simmons and Larry, uh, Lance Stevenson, who was all on my AAU team. My high school coach, Bish, wanted me to go to Indiana. And that's where I was going my whole life. I mean, I was, you know, uh, Chris Reynolds outside my brother was my favorite, favorite player, my favorite point guard. Uh, we used to always go to Indiana practices and games and see Chris and AJ play. So the whole time I'm thinking I'm going to Indiana and uh, coach, you know, got word coach Knight was, you know, on his way out. So uh, Rob Justin and Lon Kruger, uh, they knew I respected and had uh, respected coach for playing. And they just said, man, we got to get this done. We got to get Jarris and Serge and Griff and Frank are already committed. And it made sense when coach for playing said, he said, man, there's nothing like, going to your home state school because you're going to be successful after basketball. And right. still at the time, you know, at high school, you're like, man, I'm going to the league, but it's one of the, it's some of the best advice that I've got. And I'm glad that I, I, I choose the University of Illinois. And even though I didn't play a lot, I still wouldn't change it. Still wouldn't change because the memories and lifelong friendships, the wins, I mean, we, we won the Big Ten three years, went to Elite Eight. Uh, I mean, just had a lot of wow. success. A lot of success on the court and then this, the university. I mean, it was people from Peoria, Springfield that I knew. So I just like the, the school itself, you know, take the basketball, but having my brothers and some, my good friends, Griff, Serge and Frank down there. And then, you know, me and Brian Cook committed together. He was Mr. Basketball, All-State, McDonald's All-American. And he was considered the best big man in the state. And I was considered one of the best uh, point guards. So we got kind of close and we ended up committing to Illinois together as sophomores. So people, Say all this early commitment, me and Brian Cook was the first ones to start this early commitment off. And we did it our sophomore year and never looked back. Well, that had to be special. And uh, I've been following Illinois basketball ever since the days of uh, Mark Smith and Derek Holcomb coming out of uh, Richwoods in, in the late seventies almost. And they I don't know if Illinois has ever work. had four Peoria boys on the team at one time. Hey, that's going in the book. I like yes. that's why I need to talk to you, boo. That's a, that's a good <laughs> step, but we've had some, some great ones. I know I started watching Illinois basketball uh, with Tyrone, with my brother, cause he, he used to love Kenny Battle and Kendall Gill. So he put me up with, you know, up on that, um, that 89 Flying Illini team. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's, that's kind of where I kind of got hooked and became a big Illinois fan. And when I got the offer, I took advantage of it. Well, how was that? Uh, okay, you had to battle Frankie in high school. You had Ooh. to battle uh, Marcus and Sergio. And Wayne McClain, for that matter, was over there. And I know how the rivalry is between us and them. Right. And now, <laughs> and now you got to join them. So how was that? Did you was there any a little bit of an animosity? Like, man, there go them mothers right there. Oh, there they go. I can't get away from them. I come to Illinois and there they are. Right. Well, uh, I, I, that's a good question. I never thought about that, but honestly, it wasn't because it was the previous relationships before we went to Illinois. 
Like me and Frank, people don't know this, and, and it's gonna be in the book. And Frank alive, I just talked to him last week and brought it up. Me and Frank was on the state period games. A uh, guy named Raleigh Cameron coached us, and it was the first time we ever played together. And and to, people don't know this. This is a this is a gym. This is this is a, a Peoria gym right here. People don't know Frank Williams did not tie his shoes until he got the manual. Coach McClain made that boy tie his shoes. Frank was giving people 40 and 50 points with his shoes untied. So when I played him, I felt disrespectful. I felt like that's like the most disrespectful thing that you about to go battle with somebody and compete and they don't even tie their shoes. But that's how smooth and good he was. But my first time, this is what I knew he was gonna be special. We played one-on-one -on -one in front of my house in Third Street on a pole. There were, you know the telephone poles? Right. And it was a nail about 11 feet high. And Frank, just being creative, he was like, hey, let's play one-on-one. -on -one. That nailed the rim. And boom, he rolled his bike over, I'll never forget. We played for about two hours straight. And I was giving him everything I had. He was giving me, because he was in eighth and I was in seventh. And he came over and I just remember it was so dark that my mom was like, there's no way I, you can drop, you know, go home by yourself. And he's like, no, I'm fine. And, and next, you know, Frank, I see him pumping his bike and, you know, with his shirt off. And, but it was the most competitive game to this day. And I'm 40 years old that I ever played. And it was on, and we didn't even have a rim. It was, we, it, it, we just went hard, one-on-one -on -one, half court in the street without a rim. And, and, and that's, I think, what's missing with a lot of young kids today is the love and passion for the game. You know, a lot of guys want to go work out and, and, and do the drill combs. And uh, like I learned from my, my old boss, Larry Brown, uh, he said, you know, coach, those cones are good, but they don't slide and they don't try to block your shot right. either. So uh, I, I wish you could get that back. Well, whatever happened to the game, uh, a game of 21? Yeah, in game of 32, right, yeah. Fight, where if you had, if you had, uh, we played at 21, so if you had 19, you got five people guarding you. And you can't call five. No. You got you to find a way to get it off. Yeah. That, right. But I was telling my son, like, I went to Carver every day. I went to Proctor every day. And then when I got with AJ and Jeremy, my two best friends, and that's why AJ made, because, like, AJ didn't he didn't he didn't drink, he didn't want to go to parties, he didn't want to do nothing. He wanted he got in the gym with rough and shot. And then when this our summer times was this. Him and Jeremy would pick me up down the hill. We'll go eat a Bonte's. We'll go go shoot, go to open gym, go to go to central open gym, go to Manny Open Gym. And then what was cool about it, Rich was, which I think they had it planned out, they had theirs at nighttime. So you had Mike Robinson, Calvin O'Neill. So then at times, AJ was such a goon rap, gym rap. We used to go over to Pekin. Like, what brother's going over to Pekin and who? <laughs> we was going to Pekin over gym. But Matt Moran and all those guys, and Matt, I mean, they were, and J.R. Cox, they were so cool and respected the fact that, like, man, these guys are some good dudes. They just want a ball. Now, now you, next thing you know, now they're coming over to our open gym. So that's what, what made Peoria basketball so good and, 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 and different than everybody else, I thought, because of the competitiveness. And then it, Everybody wanted, you know, that's why I tell people like, when you became that guy in Peoria, it was an honor to be it, but you had to hold it down because people was coming for you. Like, okay, J this Jerry out, yeah, you gave me 40 at Roosevelt. I remember that, I'm coming at your throat. So, but it, it's a lot to come with that. And, and, and all you got to do is embrace it and the city will get behind you. That's cool. So when did you uh, decide that you wanted to get in coaching? Three Big Ten titles. You had a wonderful time at the U of I, and you played for Lana Kruger. Yep. He leads Bill Self and Coach Weber, Bruce Weber. That's amazing to have three coaches, and uh, and and not transfer, which <laughs> exactly. is amazing. And, and, and that's that's interesting you brought that up because uh, I remember calling home to my my high school coach, uh, Coach Bisher, who who played at Bradley and uh, coached there. And I said, coach, I, I may want to come home. And he said, okay, you know, they want you, you got a spot. And But I, I slept on it and it just didn't feel right. I, it just didn't feel right because I love my teammates. Uh, it, you know, I was getting a great education. Um, you know, Peoria was only an hour, 15 minutes, but I became a coach and wanted to coach through adversity. When I wasn't playing at University of Illinois and rightfully so, because I, I was behind Frank Williams, Darren Williams, D. Brown, and Luther Head, all first wow. round draft picks. Wow. So uh, it was times where I got discouraged, but 
I, I was so close with my teammates that I wanted my teammates to respect me. And I wanted the coaching staff, like, just because I'm not playing, I got to bring something to the table or I need to get up out of here. So by doing that, I started saying, okay, since I ain't playing a lot, my practice is about to come my get, become, become my games. So I, I took it personal. I made sure no one worked harder than me in practice. I won every sprint. Uh, I came out and I would say, you know what? Today is going to be D Brown day. And I just picked on D that whole day. Wouldn't <laughs> let him catch the ball. He walked to the dr get something to drink. I'm walking right behind him. He go to the bathroom, I go to the bathroom. But so when I started doing that, those different things, now, you know, I got, I'm hosting every recruit that come to Illinois. Now they say, hey, Jarris, come up and watch this film and right. we want you to be this guy. Next thing you know, I'm coaching. I'm another coach and it, it, it kind of, and, and, and I tell people all the time, find your passion as early as possible. And if you, if you don't, it, it's not, it, don't, don't be afraid, but the sooner you do, the better off you'd be. So I found my passion of coaching through adversity. And where was your first coaching job? I was I was blessed enough to start at Texas A&M, which is University of Texas Rivals, down in College Station, Texas. Now, mind you, boo, I've never been out of the state of Illinois. You know what I mean? I, you know, I'm from Peoria. I go to University of Illinois, and then Billy Gillespie gets the job, who was on coach self-staff Illinois. And he said, hey, if you could get here by Sunday, we have a team meeting and I'm gonna put you on staff. And he hung up. He didn't tell me what my position was gonna be, where wow. I was gonna live at, what my role, how much money I was gonna make. But I trusted him because I knew he, he was a man of his word. Right. And I never forget, me and my my wife today, uh, uh, I never forget, it, 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 you talk about discouraging, I could easily just lay down. The day before I had a 98 Monte Carlo on dubs, a red one, that's how I got hurt. It had J High 25 on it. I thought it was a Bentley. <laughs> the day before, the night before, they broke into my car and took my radio. My air didn't work. So we're driving to College Station, Texas from Peoria, Illinois. I've never been out of the state. I get a flat in Oklahoma, don't know how to ch change a tire. I had to spend the night in Oklahoma, go to Walmart. What I'm trying to say is that it was all these roadblocks. Right. All these roadblocks. I could easily be like, you know what? This is a sign I'm not going. I could, you know, I, I could have went with UIC with Jimmy Collins, but I took a walk out on faith, just like I did with this job, not knowing what to expect, but just knowing that uh, God got my back and if I work hard and be Jaren's, and that's just just a lot of energy and enthusiasm, I'll be fine. And, and, and God has blessed me to, to be successful so far. That's awesome, man. And how, um, so you went with Gillespie for a couple years and did he get the, didn't he get the job at Kentucky? Yes, yes. So we, we go to Texas A&M and get that thing, you know, uh, we took them to the tournament for the first time in 21 years. Um, we got all the alumni back, got got people excited. And actually, Sonny Parker from Chicago, one of my my good friends and mentors, he played at Texas A&M and um, uh, got that thing started and got the job at Kentucky. But I wasn't on the road and people who don't know that, me, I wasn't one of the three assistants who could go out on the road and recruit and coach on the floor. Right. So Bruce Weber offered me a job on the road at Illinois. Uh, and, 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 and I went from making 26,000 to 100,000. Now I never got into this business uh, for money. Uh, that always took care of itself. But, you know, coming from, you know, the South Side Peoria and the Pearson Hills, you know, making $100,000, I thought it was a misprint, boo, I promise you. And right. then when I, I mean, it, you know, so to, uh, it was like, wow, like, like this is, I could really, really make a living, feed my family up, you know, coaching. So, uh, but the money never was a big deal for me. I mean, but it was always the love for the game. It was always the passion for helping people. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, that, and, and it's, it's, it's taken me to a place, uh, places from all over the world. Like, you know, uh, from, from China to, to France, to Paris, to Sweden, to uh, who knows? I mean, just all, I've been, I've been to a lot of places. I've been to all, Every state has suffered too, and, uh, and this game has definitely blessed me to have relationships that are uh, that will last a lifetime. That's awesome, man. So you get to Kansas with Bill Self, my man, and uh, birthplace of basketball. If I'm not mistaken, is that right? No, I think Springfield is, but. Uh, Kansas is considered, James, you know, uh, the home of James Naismith, right? Yeah, yeah, that's where the game was invented at. Yeah, yeah, okay. Springfield. That's yeah, where it was yeah. invented. Okay, exactly. 
I should know that. So what was it like going there with all the tradition? Uh, being an assistant well, coach, being uh, the top recruiter? Well, well, What's that one, like? One, it was it was just really cool that Coach Self to hire me. I was one of the, I was the first player that he he's ever hired on staff as one of the, one of the role guys, and so I was so excited about working with Coach Self and learning from him. And then I didn't really appreciate it until I got to Kansas of the history and tradition. I mean, you're talking about Will Chamberlain, uh, the game of basketball, and been it there to uh, Paul Pierce, to Jock Vaughn, and to uh, all the legendary uh, players that came. came Danny came Manning. Us. Yeah, Danny Manning, who's might be considered one of the best <laughs> in college basketball history. Right. Uh, but the, the, the but what, what what we took from our experience at Lawrence was the people, the fans. It was a genuine interest and love. Like they they were mad at one and dones. You know, they, they want they want they want to see our guys go from you know boys to men and have that senior night. Our senior <laughs> night, the, the senior night there at Kansas was something special. I mean, it was, it was. They, I mean, they got there hours before it even started. So, uh, I think just the community and the fans uh, of the eight years that we, that me and my friend was there, was unbelievable because of the people. But I just, I'm, for, I'm forever indebted to Coach Self um, uh, because he believed in me. He took the opportunity and gave me a chance and. Um, the things I learned from him was, I mean, I'm a better person, man and husband because of him. And uh, that, right on. even though I'm with a great coach now, there's not too many better out there. Just, I mean, and he's just such a good, to me, it's a lot of great coaches and they, but when you're a good person too, that's just, I mean, I mean, he treats you the same way every day. I uh, want you to grow, want you to learn. He lets you be you. He let me coach and uh, I, I, I can't say it enough. I can't say enough about Coach Self and what he's done for me and my family. That's awesome, man. Um, and now you're down in uh, Austin, Texas and starting a new chapter of your life. And yes. and um, one thing I've always was hoping that you would get that big job. And I know it's coming. Come and uh, Come I remember when the Bradley position opened up, um, I thought you had a good chance of getting it. Was that tough for you? Uh, Most of uh, that, that process? Moments. Yeah, yeah, one of the toughest moments in my coaching career. Um, really? You know, I grew up um, watching Illinois basketball. Uh, I grew up watching Bradley basketball to people may, may not remember this, but I was a fan, you know, of course, of course, Hershey Hawkins was the guy. I mean, I used to go to the shop and say, Steve Winters, my guy, my, Steve Winters was my guy, my barber back then. And I said, I want the Hershey Hawkins. And he knew exactly the three lines. So I did the Hawk <laughs> for like, seven years straight where I had the three lines in my head, but I, I was in love with Anthony Manuel. I don't know if people remember him. Oh, of uh, course, Chicago, Chicago. Well, he's my age, Chicago Crane. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Did he wear number 12? I can't remember. Yeah, I, think I can't remember, but they always used to say that he had a body like Walter Payton, you know? <laughs> big, I was about yeah. to say that, big body guard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but he, he played with a, such passion and energy. I thought he was just, just so underrated, but growing up, you know, uh, and I'll tell you some of the best moments in my life to this day is my brother uh, picking me up to go to Noon Hoops. So that was my, so Bradley basketball, it's more than just, you know, a, a university, a, 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 a team that's in the Missouri Valley, that, that, that's home for me. Like I got my competitive spirit and became better because those summers at Hustler Hall during, you know, every Monday, Monday through Thursday, for 10 years straight, I went to Hustler and Howard Nathan. Then you had, you know, guys from um, Anthony Pillar uh, to Robert Dye, who played on Bradley, who they knew if they went home, they was considered scared and chickens. So the good Bradley basketball players always stayed in the summertime because they know this is the best run in the state. We had everybody and it will go from noon to about three in the, in the, in the best thing about it was because I was always the youngest one, was afterwards, all those guys would just sit down, Mike Robinson, uh, AJ, um, I mean, just whoever, the who's who in Peoria basketball, and we just talk basketball. It, you know, Serge, Griff, Frank, I mean, just talk about how many times, man, you'll be, then my brother and them will come up and say, man, we ran Manuel in the 80s, and, you know, just going back and forth, and then right. uh, it was a guy named Oliver. Oh, he was the oldest one in the building. I want to say he played for the Lakers, but he was had his shirt tucked in, Oliver Mack, and he had one of the smoothest jump shots. He, he was like, 
like the old head, but everybody knew you couldn't leave him open and, and he was one of the first first to get picked. But those memories uh, of, 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 of noon hoops is, is where I got my passion for Bradley basketball. So of course, you know, growing up playing up there and it still feel funny not having the field house. That was a special, special court and a special place where the whole community and the whole Peoria came together on that Friday night. And it was, everybody forgot about their problems, forgot about, you know, work and what they got to, you know, right. get done. It was where everybody came and, and enjoyed. And not only for the players, I'm talking about from the cheerleaders to the band and you see your family in the front row and in, in, in the seats. And then you see the students having got their new outfits on, they, they set out and got, I mean, it was, it was, it was a movement. It was, it was a way of life. And, I, and that's something that I, I will always cherish and I miss it so much, but, and that's why I'm so excited that, you know, people like yourself, uh, and I love how you say kids these days need to know their history. I mean, and, and, and it's rightfully so. So uh, by you doing this and, and, and you, you putting that history out really motivated me. And, and I think it'd be really cool that these kids and people around the state could actually go and not have to go to a website, but there's really nothing on Peoria basketball on the internet either. But now you have, besides, if you don't go to your stuff, you won't know about Peoria basketball. But now it could be a book where people could go and see, look up Ivan Stone and Tony Weisinger and, and, and some of the best that ever done it. And, and, and know those are my actors. boys. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Those are my boys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yes. well, growing up with, with AJ, we used to always, so Willie Coleman, you know, Willie, if anytime you got in the lane, Willie used to smack down, right? We used to call that the Coleman. We like, and then, you know, T.Y. with the signature spin move. Anytime somebody spin, we'd be like, oh, he got T.Y. So to this day, my players know who Tony Washington is because <laughs> of the spin move. So, you know, I, I grew up on you guys and th those guys, uh, uh, to this day, you know, when I go home, I always, you know, stop by and see Ivan and I talk to, uh, you know, Coach T.Y., you know, all the time, you know, with, with him being at Illinois, you know, playing at Illinois is always a, you know, a, a bond there with the Peoria boys, you know, that, that went to Illinois, you know. I think after T.Y., it, it dropped off for a minute. Jerry Hester picked it back up. And then Serge, you know, Griff, Frank, then myself, DJ, then, you know, with Adam and, and Monte, which uh, it, it was, it's a beautiful thing to always see those guys from Peoria. Can't forget Doug Altenberger. Oh, I forgot. We're one of the best. I forgot. That's disrespectful. Yeah. <laughs> he, he was a bad boy. <laughs> they still talk about him down there. <laughs> Man, we go back to fourth grade, so I always try to That's right. mention, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I try to mention Doug. And of course, Tony and I played high school ball together. Uh, well, man, I know um, today is a busy day for you. You've got uh, some recruiting to do, but the signing day. And I asked people if they wanted uh, to give any questions. They came in quick. Is that so right? you ready for this? Yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready. This Let me see how reason. much time. How much time we got? Oh, we good. We good. Okay. We good. Yeah. We All good. right. And uh, okay, right off the bat. Brian, Dumf Brian Dumphy, the athletic director at our alma mater central, mm -hmm. he wanted to know who was your favorite teacher in high school? Ooh, wee, that's a great question. All right, I got to go back to Roosevelt and start with two people. To this day, I have a personal relationship and, and they can't, I mean, they come to every game. I, mean, no, I shouldn't say every game, everywhere I come, I, you know, wherever I stop at, they make sure they come see me. But Lee, uh, Lee Powers, who was my grade school coach, is one of the best coaches um, to ever coach the game out of Peoria. Then my librarian, Janet Colvin, who uh, used to make me miss recess to read. I could read, but I didn't like reading out loud. And she used to make me read out loud over and over. And to this day, I credit her because that's all I do is present things to, 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 to recruits and to my players. So she really helped me get over that hump of, of reading out loud and speaking out loud. And then when you go to Central, first first person is Miss Sleep. She was um, uh, uh, Miss Sleep. Yeah, yeah, Miss Sleep. And then Randy Sleep was her was her was her husband. Uh, right. May you rest his uh, rest. Yeah, he his was team. my counselor. He was my counselor. So yeah. so they used to tag team me. I couldn't get away with nothing. If right. I was in trouble or I wasn't doing that, she'd send me to him, and then he'd send me right back to her. But <laughs> she had a genuine love for people. She had a genuine love for helping people, and I was—I must say I was one of her favorites. And she won't—she won't—she won't like me saying that because she loved all students. But 
uh, that was, I looked at her like a mom and a grandmother because she would tag me by the ear, pop me on the head, but always gave me hugs, always encouraged me. Uh, some of my toughest times in my life. And so she, to this day, she, she has a special place in my heart. And I, I got to credit Ruff and Coach Bisher, uh, even though they weren't teachers, but you know, those two, you know, stood on me and held me right. accountable and, uh, and really pushed me. And then um, Senior Nelson was my Spanish teacher, uh, my Spanish and French teacher. Uh, and, and she was just funny, full of joy, uh, loud, uh, just loved, loved, loved to teach and her energy was contagious. And then, uh, so those, those were, you know, I, I know I'm leaving some out, but uh, those for sure was, had a big influence in me. That's really a good question. And uh, it's great that you paid homage to so many that had that impact on you. And then he has another question, uh, coach's influence. Who do you call for advice when things are not going well for you? Who do you call? Who is your go-to person? Well, my go-to person, he actually is a coach, but uh, he's a coach in, in, in the ministry, but Pastor Deverell Hubbard, my, my godfather who pastors uh, St. Paul Baptist Church, who my grandfather, uh, the late Dr. Reverend Amos Abbott, who pastored there for 25 years, but uh, Pastor Hubbard is a guy that's, he loves sports. Uh, he play, you know, he, he tries to play, uh, but he's a guy that, that's, that, that, that he doesn't get too high, doesn't get too low. Uh, but uh, in the coaching profession, uh, I, I've always, you know, uh, uh, really, really appreciate my relationship with Larry Brown. Uh, he's a Hall of Fame coach. He's the only coach who won an NCAA, NCAA championship and NBA title. Uh, he coached Allen Iverson and uh, he's 80 going on 40. I talk to him every morning at 730 in the morning when I'm going to work. And he's a guy that uh, he's a sponge. Like I'll give you an example. When we, when, when we used to go out to recruit, he got mad, not mad at me, but the first time we go recruit, he said, coach, where's your, where's your, your notepad at? Where's your, where's your, your basketball diagrams? I'm like, uh, coach, I thought we were just going to evaluate the kid and talk to the kid. He said, yeah, but we're going to watch him practice, right? I said, yeah. He said, coach, if we see something in practice that we like, we're going to do it tomorrow. And I thought that was the coolest thing. Here is a, a Hall of Fame coach that will take drills from high school coaches if he liked them. And then the best thing about it, I used to, I was um, able to teach it to our team the next day. So now, one, he's humble and he's a sponge and we're doing different things. And two, he's letting me coach and grow and, 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 and tell people how to get into the sets. And I mean, it was just so, so amazing working with him. So. Uh, when, when, when things come to tough times or, or I need to make a decision, you know, Pastor Hubbard and Larry Brown, those are my, excuse me, those are my two go-to. Well, I tell you, um, Larry Brown is a Globetrotter fan and he yes, always he used to come in the locker room uh, when he was in Indiana. And then when he was in Philly, he would come to the locker room, just soft-spoken guy, real cool. Yeah. And he was just a, a brilliant man, just so nice. And I, I would always be like, how the hell did Allen Iverson not get along with this dude? This dude he, seems like he is the coach's, yeah. I mean, the player's coach. Nah, I can he, never he understand different. it. Just a nice dude. <laughs> no, he a little different, boo, when, when, when he get inside those lines. Oh, <laughs> okay. I, I saw I saw the uh, Jekyll and Hyde, exactly. right? Yeah, yeah. He had, he'd be the first one to tell you that. He had, it's a switch, you know, that all the great ones have. They could, it's just it's something about them that they could turn it on and off. Okay, well, here's another one. Let's see. In your recruiting, and you are considered one of the top recruiters in the country, and um, that that's not that's not everything about you, of course. Right. But you are known as one of the top recruiters in the country. Were there any high school coaches that gave you any trouble in recruiting their ball players? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you this, it was a it was a big time recruit out of Chicago, Illinois. I won't say his name, I won't mention the coach, but uh, and it wasn't nothing personal, it was just off relationships, but right. uh, he, he wanted him to go to DePaul. And, and you know, uh, and and uh, didn't didn't really tell me, but I, I kind of kind of figured it out on my own. But uh, it, there's gonna be times where it's gonna be situations like that. I just think if you do your job and treat people the right way. Uh, and it just, it just keep working. You can overcome that. All right. Well, this is actually from me because, you know, I got 
a basketball camp that your your nephews went to. And um, to this day, they still talk about that that camp, how, how much fun they had. And the relationships, like if I'm out to eat, I'm like, yeah, we 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 were at camp with them at Boo. I'm like, okay, I mean, it's always that. That's that's good to hear. Um, I kind of miss them. I haven't seen them in a while. I hope they're doing well. Look, you'll be proud of them. They're doing really well. Awesome. Well, this is for my campers that are watching. What do you look for in in a recruit? Of course, you're looking at his basketball prowess, but what are some of the other factors that you look at? Do you look at their social media? So, I, I, you know, the places I've been at, you know, I've been blessed to be at Kansas the last eight years and now here at Texas, but I, I, I've actually stopped recruiting kids because of their social media. Wow. I hope they're here. I hope they're listening to that. Yeah. Well, and I'm not the only one. It's, it, so it's it's a lot of a lot of a lot of a lot of kids that lost out on their scholarships and their dream schools because of stuff that they put on social media. And and because this, this is a business, this is I feed my family. And then if there's two kids that are the same talent and you 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 acting nuts on social media and this guy is not, I'm taking this guy. And it's that simple. It's it's, it's, it's that it's that black and white. And so I, I always tell even our players, be conscious because you can't get take it back. Once you put it out, it's out there and it, and it follows you. So uh, definitely be careful of your social media. And then I want to, I want to say this too, because it, it, it gets under my skin when I go to these schools and recruit these players. I've, I've Three good players, I stopped recruiting because how the parents act in the stands. Like, how, like you, you shouldn't be another coach. You should be there to support and to cheer, not coach. You don't come to practice every day. You're not putting in time and effort, but come Friday night, you want to come up and, and, and be and be the coach now. And that's not fair to the kid. And it really, really hurts the kid. And it really, really not fair to the coach. So parents, be parents, support and support and be parents. Don't come to games being coaches because you can turn college coaches. I, I, I've been in stands where my, my boss said, hey, we're not messing with we, we don't have time for that. We can't deal with that. Wow. And that's why you see kids transfer. Wow. Okay. Uh, Damn, I hope I don't turn nobody off. Just let you, I'm a nice person. I'm a good coach, you know, but I'm just keeping it real. I, I want to help you guys, but uh, it, it, that, that uh, uh, social media and parents, because uh, uh, there's so many players out there, boo. Unless you LeBron, ain't nobody dealing with that. Not now. Real talk. Ain't nobody, you don't have time. You, I mean, especially with the portal now when you can transfer and play right away. So you mean to tell me as a high school kid, people, coaches are gonna take a fifth year guy or, or a senior that can transfer than, than a high school kid because he's older and mature. So don't, wow. don't shoot yourself in your foot and weed yourself out over no social media or your mom and dad act, acting crazy in the stands. That's real talk, man. That's excellent, Jarrence. Next one. Um... What's it like recruiting the one and dones? Um, it's uh, because it, you've had quite a few, haven't you, at Kansas? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and the main one, Joel Embi, who came to Coach Self office and wanted to red shirt because he didn't think he was good enough. Really? Yes, and I mean JoJo was raw, but Coach gave him confidence, and Coach gave him like, dude, you're a bad boy. You're gonna be okay. I get out of my office, and then next thing you know, you know, he's the number two pick in the draft. But then you go on the other hand with Andrew Wiggins, who was had the biggest hype since LeBron James, where he knew he would it wasn't no one and done, it was six months and done. As soon as the season over, <laughs> you know, when you project the number one pick, you got to go get the work, and that's what he right. did. So um the one and done's uh as a coach, you don't you don't you hate to see him leave, but I will say this. It changed my thought. One of my best friends is Darren Williams. <clears throat> and he invited me to the draft when he got drafted. He got drafted number three. And, and co people be like, coach, why you go so hard on me? Why you owe me? And I say this because the reason why I'm so passionate and I go so hard on my kids is that lottery weekend changed my life. When we get there, the day of the draft, there's two charter buses. There's one for the draft picks and then one for the family. So bus leaves at six o'clock. Being a coach and being from Larry Brown, if you're on time, you, you you late. So I get there at 5.45, and I'm sitting in the second seat. 
And I just watched all these families, mothers, grandmothers, aunties, uh, you know, they, some of them children, like money don't solve everything, but these people have been working two or three jobs their whole life. And to see them just dressed up and smile and full of joy, boo, I start crying. I literally start getting emotional where like these people's lives are about to change because of the game of basketball. So when I saw that, and so and when I and I go in these kids' homes and I, and, and I, I sometimes tear up or I'm on the edge of my seat is because of that moment that I that you can help somebody change their lives and their family lives and that's that, that that's to me the best thing in coaching is to help and to serve uh, others. That is cool, man. Let's see. At Kansas, you know there were I remember the the fight that broke out and the kid that got in trouble, you were right there trying to prevent that. What was that, uh, what was that like uh, when that broke out? That was, that was a crazy scene, but was, you were trying to, to help that boy out before it was too late. Because I, 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 one, I know he's an unbelievable kid. That's, that was something that was out of the ordinary, out of the blue. I think he panicked. Uh, it's like, if you get in a bar fight and you know, you just, people swinging, you see something, you may just pick it up. and. And that's and, and that, that's the only thing I was thinking. Where if he, you know, if he did, you know, hit that guy, it would have, you know, could, he could have went to jail. You know, it could have been anything. And I wasn't thinking at the time. You know, our whole staff was just making sure that we were getting our guys out of the way. But it, but it happened so quick. Where your reactions was just to just go and try right. to help. And uh, and I was right there in the scene. But the, uh, the kid, that's what you know. It it, it didn't turn out great for him with that situation, and unfortunately, because he's a good kid deep down inside. All right. Well, I was watching uh, the Midnight Madness game. I don't, I can't remember if it was just this past uh, couple of months or was it last year? And you guys had Snoop Dogg on uh, your Midnight Madness game, right? <laughs> and personally, I enjoyed it. It looked like the, uh, the 20,000 people that were there enjoyed it. But you guys caught a whole lot of flack about that game, didn't you? Yes, we did. Uh, well, uh, not, 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 it wasn't anybody's fault, but it was. People just kind of missed the fine line in the contracts that there may be uh, some acrobatic dancing. Uh, but <laughs> we had to overcome that. It was, it was acrobatic it was, dancing. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, oh, you mean pole dancing? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, but I'm sorry, I said <laughs> as bad as you know it was for the media, uh, our, our, our recruits and our players and the people, the twenty thousand, the sixteen thousand people that was there, you know, thought it was pretty cool. But if, if next time that happened, we, we need to get the X-rated version of, of Snoop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. This is about Peoria. The toughest players that you faced in high school? Frank Williams. Frank Williams, A not number even, one? Not even close, man. He did stuff on the court where people be like trying to do moves. Like he'll tap it between your legs twice. You know how usually people just tap it in, in the front. Frank would tap it from behind, pause, and then throw it back. And, and then he had this thing, he made it up and called four times. And one of the coolest moments, I that Frank, I'm sitting watching. I was, uh, I never, it was, yeah, Frank, it was Frank Serge Griffin, I think Willie Coleman, but whatever it was, Frank was on the top man's court. It was first time Frank Williams ever on the top man's court in the Gus Macker. And he said, he went like this. He says, they used to call me Skizzy or Snacks. He's like, Jay Skizzy. He just threw up the four. I'm like, uh, where you from? They, you know, they gangster disciples. They ain't, you know, ain't no folk on I think he throwing up <laughs> just, that's the first thing that, that thought of. And then he, he went, he crossed over once, crossed over twice, and then crossed over three times. And then he kind of like hezzo and the guy lunged and then he hit him four times and then just pulled up for a jump shot. So yeah. imagine Frank, like he was doing this. And this is a defender, but Frank, every time he, he came, he had just cross over and pulled up. But the one though, Big Ten championship game, we're down one. No, excuse me. That, that, that's that. I'm, I'm gonna give you the play in the first half. Two, two plays in the Big Ten championship game. Frank gets stuck in the lane. In the Big Ten, they had the Big Ten Player of the Year on the team. He's like this. Frank's stuck in the lane. 
and the guy has his hands up. Frank throws the ball around his arm and catches it in the air and lay it up. I like you have to, I can't really explain it, but mm-hmm. he, he was he couldn't dribble anymore. So he threw it up on him, and then as the ball's coming, he jumped up there and just hit it off the backboard. Then for the game point, I never forget this one. I know when, when Coach McClain was real. Coach Self draws up a side out of bounds, basically get the ball to Frank. <laughs> we coming out the timeout, and Frank uh, after we huddle up, and I, you, 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 what's the guy from Muhammad Ali? The tra- you remember uh, Muhammad Ali trainer? Uh, Bund- Jamie Fox Bundini, right? Bundini Brown, Rumble, Young Man Rumble. That was me. That was me for Frank Williams. I was always in his ear. I used to make up lies like Frank. They call you soft down there. I used to, that was me. So every time he used to leave, I used to be like right here. Like, come on, fam. Let's bring us home. You know, Coach Klein said, Frank, hey, I know he, he, he did all that. It was a, he said, hey, let's go home. Make this. And i never forget Frank. Frank always, well, people don't know this. When Frank got for real the series, he used to put, pull his shorts up and they used to be like high waters. He started tucking his tucking his shirt in and said, I got you, coach. So I'm, I'm, I'm watching everything. And I said, you got me too? He said, Skizzy, we, we kicking it tonight. And we it was the best night of my life. I DJ, we had this bar called Cam's and I DJ from 11 to one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> All because of Frank, when, when, I, when, when I got on that bus and, and got on that plane, I felt like we always had a chance to win. I used to always look, I'm like, where Frank at? All right, Frank, you straight? All right, and I and I sleep like a baby because it's certain players that that could could, could 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 change the game like that. And him and AJ are the, by far the two best players I played against. And then going up against Howard Nathan, who was my idol, you know, growing up, you know, down down the hill, watching him at Proctor, uh, it was he, he was he was he was he was like a, a living legend. He was like he was our Michael Jordan, and and I never forget. I, I used to. Uh, uh, go to Proctor and I used to uh, ch- try to go between my legs from Third Street to Proctor. And the and people know this, Howard had a red, I want to say a red Toyota or Honda. It was all red, black tinted windows. We thought it was a Bentley, a, a, a Lamborghini down the hill. And he saw me, because I saw him drive up. I'm like, man, I miss Nate. Like I was almost to the point where I was about to go back home because People know at Proctor, as a shorty, you can get on the court. You just had to dribble your ball. I mean, they had Gigi, all those guys. They, they took up both courts. So you just had to dribble your ball around and just watch. So I used to just go up there, and I was, like, so devastated. I'm like, man, I miss Nate. And fam, he drove. So here's Carver, the, the court. He drives off and spins the block and stops and gets out the car and showed me love. That Right there, like, like it was to this, I'm 40. I remember that like it's yesterday. Yesterday. But for him, wow. and that's what made Nate Nate because he knew he everybody looked up to him, but he didn't treat people like that. Right. He made you feel comfortable around him. Like I, I remember Jeremy, Jeremy Wilson, my best friend, said he went over there with Charles when they were close. And he said, fam, Nate was uh, uh on the couch sleeping. So we call him Nate Junior Howard. So when I say he said Howard was the only one that could put orange shoestrings and some Jordans and make them look nice. And I'll never forget, he said he was sitting there asleep and he had his Jordans in front of him about to go to Proctor. He's always taking a nap. And Jeremy said, man, I would just walk by him and just look at him. And it was like a light shining on him. But that's how the kids wow. down here looked up to him. But he would, I don't know, think it'd ever be another Howard Nathan. Now, and I'm not even talking about talent wise. Like I think maybe you could give a case where Sean, Frank and AJ talent wise may be better than him. I'm talking about everything with it, the aura and the legend, the legend that, and then the biggest games is where he showed out the most. And that's, that's where people respect Nate the most. Well, I tell you, I, I went to his funeral. Yeah, I saw you there. Yeah. Two years ago now. And uh, Mm. it really showed how much people loved him. It was amazing. The outpour of, uh, of uh, people that were there to pay respects to him. It was amazing to see all the ball players, all different types of uh, walks of life that was there to support him. Yes, yes, yeah. I, I actually, my, my son was in the um, AAU championship game. Uh, they won Saturday and they was going to be in the championship game uh, Sunday. And I had to make a decision because I never get to see my son play. 
But my son, I, I purposely took my son to Peoria to meet Howard when he his last some of his last days. So my son even knew. He he would say, I said, Dad, I said, Jay, you know how I feel about Howard. I may have to go to his funeral, miss your game. And as a 10-year-old, he's like, Dad, I go. Do you, you know what I'm saying? So he knew how he affect, how much he affected me. Uh and, and to me, and I and I say what's the difference between Howard too with this is when he got in his car accident. And I came up there that next day uh, from Champaign. I couldn't feel sorry for him. He was like, Jay, I'm, 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 we, I'm gonna be playing you one-on-one -on -one here in about two weeks. Like that's how strong in his mindset, he was uh, the dogs of all dogs. It don't get no tougher than Howard. And that's what I'm saying, like where I think he separated himself from everybody else, his mindset and his, and his mental. Right. His mental was, he thought he was a bad boy and he showed it. <laughs> and he was. And he was, he was. I remember uh, David Booth introduced me to him. I was in maybe my first year with the Globetrotters and I was down at David's house, had me a brand new uh, Mustang convertible. Awesome. And he introduced me to Howard and Howard picked my brain. He said, man, show me some drills. And I showed him some very, very difficult uh, uh -huh. ball handling and dribbling drills. He did all of them, all of them. He and he was the game. trying to pick everything from me. And then, of course, you know, David said that he was going to be a bad, uh, a bad boy. And of course, the rest is history. Well, this is actually a good question it's from uh, from Adam Duvall. He said, we all know you were a good you're a good recruiter. But I want to hear about the near misses in recruiting that you had. What are some of the big name players? that you thought you had locked up, but then they committed to other schools? It's only, I, <laughs> it's only one that I can tell you right off the bat to this day, I think about it because uh, whoever got this kid was going to win the national championship and they did. And it was Jaleel Okafor. Uh, I was recruiting Jaleel Okafor at the University of Illinois as an eighth grader. I remember Bruce Weber was like, why do you have me at an eighth grader game? And Jaleel ran out and he tapped me, said, I apologize, because he was 6'8 as an eighth grader. Um, I knew his dad, had a personal relationship with the kid, and we had him, thought he had him. And I'll never forget this when I knew it was real. And people say, well, you had Kansas, you're supposed to win. Uh, you were the Hall of Fame coach, you're supposed to get the McDonald's All-American. But they don't understand that when you put on that jersey, everybody gives you your best shot. And we're recruiting against Duke, Kentucky, North Carolina, Texas, some of the best of the best. So you're not just, you know, you, you're recruiting 20 guys and you try to, you know, uh, get steal them away from the top of the top or the best of the best. But I'll tell you this story. I, this one I knew was real. It's my second week on the job and Jaleel Oakford called me. And uh, we're talking, talking. We always just talk right after we got out of school. And he said, uh, Coach, hold on right quick. I got to take this. Clicks back over and said, uh, he's never got off the phone with me. He said, coach, I got to take this. I'm going to call you back. I'm like, oh, she must look good. You know, I'm thinking it's a girl. He said, uh, he got quiet. And he, he wasn't laughing. He said, uh, no, coach, this is Coach K. And I looked at I said, as, as in Duke, Coach K? He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm going to call you right back. And I said, oh. <laughs> so to this day, I think about that. To this day, I think about that. But that's the one Jaleel over for and they ended up winning the national championship that year too. Because him and Tyus okay. Jones, no matter where they were gonna go, they were gonna go together. I don't know if you were at Illinois at the time, but I spoke at uh, Bruce Weber basketball camp at Illinois. And yeah, afterwards I, I sat down and talked with, huh? I said, I, you wasn't, I wasn't there because you know, I wouldn't remember yeah. that. And um, I sat and talked with Wayne for about two hours in that rec center with the track around it. Yeah, 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 the armory. And, um, he told me, this was around the time that they were recruiting, I believe, Eric Gordon. Yeah. And I think they had him. He had committed. And I think um, Kelvin Sampson came in and stole him, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. But he was talking about, he said, if we recruit somebody and Coach K do a home visit, it's all over. It's over. Because he said, he said that Coach well, K, he said Coach K will cry on his home visit. He'll cry and use his military like Sean Livingston. Uh, grandfather was in the, and was was serving the services, and, and Coach K was a military guy, and it was over with. 
like Sean, Sean Livingston was going to do because Coach K had, he did a good job of Reggie and the grandfather. Wow. Yeah, he'll cry in a minute on some God like, yeah. <laughs> well, here's the last question because I know you got a, a big conference call coming up and um, I think it's the best question of all. What does Peoria mean to you? Mm. Wow, I like that. Man, right wing, uh, uh, home. And when I say home, I mean uh, my family, my friends. Uh, I, I tell people this all the time. I feel like the whole Peoria has helped raise me from my, 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 my St. Paul Baptist Church family uh, to all my teachers from Keller. Oh, I left out of Miss Thomas, who's my principal at Keller. She kind of started it all where I believe in teachers and administration, people that really, really try to help you. And she, like, she almost got, it, I used to go to her every day and say, can we please have a basketball team? And she, to this day, she teased me about that. But uh, Miss Thomas, who's my, my uh, and you go uh, to Roosevelt, to, to Central, and to, uh, uh, to, to just, just the people down the hill and to uh, the 89 team who they all, to this day, they call me little bro. And, uh, uh, talk to Chris Reynolds. He has my brother original game jersey that the band director gave to him. So uh, anytime, whether somebody is singing, cooking, if you're from Peoria, it, it, it brings me a joy uh, to, to say I'm from Peoria. And, you know, people always say, I, I correct them all the time, but I know you probably do it too when they, you say you're from Peoria, Illinois, or they say, oh, you're from Chicago. No, 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 no. <laughs> as much as I love Chicago, my, my wife from Chicago, right. my dad's from Chicago, I always correct him and say, no, I'm from Peoria, Illinois. And that, and that's, and that, that, that was what Peoria means to me, means, means home, family, and, um, uh, and a lot of great, great basketball players <laughs> that come out of it. That's a great that's question. Cool. I, yeah, that's a good question. Well, look here, gang. Um, Jarrett's has got a um, very important meeting Got to keep uh, my job. 15. Yeah, <laughs> he's got a very important meeting. But if you have more questions, please just put them in the comments section. Um, this will be uploaded to uh, YouTube sometime tonight, and it'll live on forever. This was special, Jaren. This was absolutely that. special, man, to have you on. I was in Peoria a month ago, and I asked folks who they wanted to see, and a lot of people wanted you to be on. And we finally worked it out. It wasn't easy, though. Uh, it wasn't no, easy no. getting this brother, man. I had to go to my boss. I said, Coach, I said, man, I got to do this way. I can't back out on this way. But I, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm, I'm humbled. Uh, uh, know that you. I, I always got your back. I always got your support. Uh, I definitely need you to help put this book out because your information and knowledge and your connections is is uh, what motivated me and it's something I need. But I know... I, uh, I got you. I know. I know you do. I know you do, and I appreciate that. And keep keep this up because this is this is what we need during these times. And uh, you brought a lot of people together, uh, not only on the screen, but you know the the, the hundreds of, hundreds of people that, that that's always watching. And like you said, this is this is something you could go back and show your kids. And and I appreciate that. Keep up the good work, my man. All right, my brother from my Peoria, God. Illinois, Peoria High. Always. Good to see you. Continued <laughs> success to you. And I can't wait for you, man, to get up there and uh, be in that NCAA tournament on it's the sideline, man. No, I'm always representing the crib. I'm, all, right. I'm always representing Peoria. Much love, boo. Much love back at you. Thank you, love. All right. Okay, gang, that's a wrap. That's Jairus Howard, man. That was fun. I enjoyed having him on, and I hope that you enjoyed listening to what he had to say. He is uh, a special guy. I remember the first time that I met him. He, his, uh, his voice just, it carried, his presence was just enormous. And I knew that he would be successful as a coach. Just a matter of time until he gets that big job. It's coming. I can't wait. So that's a wrap, like I said, and um, hope to see you guys soon. Um, we'll try to pick this up next week. I don't know what show we're going to do, but it's difficult to try to, to coordinate these shows. But We've done about 35 now, so it's been fun. I wish you all the best of luck and hope to see you next week. Take care. God bless. Peace.